Thanks. I love that song. A couple of things um, want us to be looking toward uh, Paula and Annette will be uh, feeding the homeless on Wednesday and they're going to prepare the soups. If you are interested in, in going with, being a part of that, they're sitting right over here and you can, uh, you can check with her or check with me later and, and join them in that effort. We have traditionally had uh, Santa pictures uh, right after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving uh, is less than two weeks away. So a uh, little, little remiss uh, in saying this, but if, I believe it was the first Saturday is what I remember uh, in December that we will be uh, doing that in our fellowship hall. And we got a backdrop that uh, we'll be taking pictures, inviting the community, and, and that'll be on our sign, of course, for days ahead of that. But that, that will happen. It is uh, something we try to do every year. Family pictures are quite expensive. And uh, last year, we had a family of 26, three generations, came and got their picture made. And that was about the most special thing I saw that whole year long. So uh, just keep that in mind. Nice breakfast this morning. If you came to breakfast and uh, came back to services, try to stay awake. Uh, I know, <laughs> I know you might be a little full, a little satisfied this morning, so we'll, uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the more fiery characters in all of Scripture this morning. Doug reminded us this morning of our passage in Hebrews that's kind of the, the theme of this uh, series of lessons, that we're, we're surrounded by witnesses, chapter 12 says, that went through their lives not actually receiving the promises that were given. They, they got the presence of God, they, they got the beginnings of God's work, but God's work was going on over a series of generations. And it says they saw his work and they welcomed it, but that means it was in front of them when they died. It had not happened yet. I, uh, I've been going through some things, so I found this picture this morning. Is that why? Yeah. That's my dad uh, sitting in our uh, dining room looking out our double glass doors. It was his favorite place. But his favorite place wasn't in that room. His favorite place was anywhere where he could see God's work. And he could just sit and watch for hours and would always take that in and enjoy it. I bring him up today because there were things that my dad did not see. He's been gone almost two years. The month that he passed away, I was having eye surgery. I had it at the beginning and the end of that month. My sight was restored having worn glasses all of my life. And dad really didn't know that that happened. He really wasn't in on it. He was not uh, well the last couple of weeks, and the second surgery happened after he passed. And so it's, it's a reminder to me that sometimes things are going to happen, and if we anticipate those things and we care about those things, it's like we can see them happening. And that's what this uh, series is all about. Let's skip a couple of slides here. Faith finishes the story is the, the way I want to characterize this. We're going to look at John the Baptist this morning. This uh, study is really what inspired this series. There's only three lessons. We talked last week about Abram. We're going to talk next week about Simeon, also in Luke chapter 1, which is where we'll be this morning. John the Baptist begins in Scripture in Luke chapter 1, and there are 80 verses in this first chapter. Now, it's got a section that includes Mary and Jesus, but it's basically about John's family. Zacharias was a priest, and he was to go in and tend the incense, the altar of incense in the temple. It was his turn. They had to take turns. They had a course and a schedule and a rotation. It was his turn. 
he went in to do that. And he was described as, he and his wife, Elizabeth, as blameless, but they were childless. And so the theme of barrenness that began, as we talked last week, with Abraham and Sarah, and by the way, continued through the three generations of the patriarchs, uh, all of them, those women uh, were unable to have children for a while. And God blessed them with children in time. But an angel appears to Zacharias while he's tending the incense and, and interacts with him and gives him insight into the answer to his prayer that they have a child. And so this is what the angel says, verses 15 and 16 of Luke chapter 1. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's a quote from Malachi chapter 4, the last chapter in the Old Testament. So the angel says, uh, your, your prayers have been answered. You're going to have a child. It's going to be a son. He, he will be great. Uh, he will bring you great joy, he also told John. I think that's going to be a given. But this idea that he would appear in the spirit and power of Elijah is different from the typical teaching that occurred around the temple in Jerusalem. We were talking yesterday to Annette and, or, uh, yes, Annette and Paula. I looked at Paula and that wasn't right to say her name. <laughs> and uh, they were describing my preaching and, and they said, you know, not hellfire and brimstone or anything like that. I said, no, 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 teaching preacher. That's what goes on in the temple. John, however, was a shouter. All right? Are you getting it? He's out by the riverbank and he's screaming his head off. <laughs> it, it's a whole different environment. And we'll come back to that in a second. But it is, it is a spirit that existed in Elijah. Of course, it's God's spirit. And there is a power associated with it, which also was in Elijah, as, again, we'll come back to in just a moment. So in the womb, and I'll read those verses, John was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not to be mixed, not to be mistaken with what alcohol might do to someone, a different kind of spirit, the Holy Spirit. And both of his parents are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak prophecy, words of God, uh, blessing into his life during this chapter in Luke chapter 1. And that, that occurs also by the Spirit. Enter Cousin Mary. So somewhere else, actually far north of uh, Jerusalem, an angel appears to another young woman. The angel answered and said to her, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And even behold, your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. Remember, she was barren. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's what we talked about last week with Abraham and Sarah. They both laughed when they heard they were going to be pregnant, Abraham and Sarah, but it happened and it became true. So Mary, who is not to have relations with her intended they are not married, just betrothed. Mary leaves and goes to visit her cousin in Jerusalem, a couple of days' journey away. And as she was told, Elizabeth is in her sixth month. 
And so we pick up the story in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? Behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. You know, I could go a lot of places with that in our national debate right now. But you just, just let those words sink in. This is not a mass, it's not a blob. It's a human being with emotion and the Spirit of God. The baby leaped in her womb. The angel promised that the cause of that would be the Holy Spirit. That was in fact what occurred and therefore we have a child who's not going to be like other children. And he's not going to be a teaching preacher. <laughs> and you child will be called I'm missing a word there. The prophet of the Most High is what it should say. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. This is what Zacharias said. Zacharias was not able to speak because he didn't believe the angel that appeared to him, according to the angel. Both Zacharias and Mary asked a question after they were told they were going to have children. The angel says that Zacharias' question reflected that he didn't believe. And so he was not able to speak until the child came. Mary asked how this should be, but even Elizabeth said, you believed when the angel came and told you. And that, of course, was from uh, prophecy, that that knowledge came to Elizabeth. So here's our description of John, the last verse of, of Luke chapter 1, verse 80. The child continued to grow and become strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I don't, I don't think any of you who are parents this morning would react calmly if your child came in and said, I'll be living in the desert from now on. By the way, I'll be eating locusts and honey. That's how I'll sustain myself. He was probably known as a wild man. You know, one of those guys that's out there somewhere. And when he finally appeared and began yelling out by the river, he attracted a crowd. John was different. John had one purpose in life and he saved himself for this brief period of time where he prepared the way for the Messiah to come. In Luke chapter 3, I'll use that version of, of his ministry. The word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness because that's where he was living. And he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Zechariah's prophecy said. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So as prophesied and, and in reality, John is one who turned hearts. I, I don't think we appreciate the impact of those words. The times then are similar to now. You may be asking yourself, what in the world? What in the world could happen to bring people back to an understanding that there's a God in heaven and he cares about what's going on on this earth? Could one guy yelling out by the river make that big a difference? They flocked to him in the droves. And he turned the hearts of a nation by just saying, 
there's somebody coming. He's going to be great. You've been expecting him. You know what the prophets say. It's time you got ready, which probably means you need to repent <laughs> before he comes. That was his message. A message of repentance characterized by baptism and forgiveness of sins. Now in verse 10, chapter 3 tells us how the crowd interacted with him. What is repentance, by the way? John was very specific. The crowds were questioning, saying, Then what shall we do? What do you mean, repent? And he would answer and say to him, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. That's called repentance. That's not your everyday get up and do task, is it? And he who has food is to do likewise. You have plenty of food, you find someone who does it, and you share. That's a basic heart response that anyone can do. And so John calls and says, you want to change this world, you change it. You do things differently. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Um, that's how they made their money. <laughs> it's interesting to me that John did not say tax collecting is not, a, is not an honorable profession. Quit. He didn't do that. He said, don't cheat people. Soldiers came. I didn't show these verses. Soldiers came. What do we do? Well, be fair. Be fair. Execute the law with real justice. Don't do it like a lot of the soldiers do it. Don't do it like a lot of the tax collectors do it. Do what you have to do and no more. Don't cheat people. Share on one hand. Don't cheat on the other hand. Don't be mean. Don't be disrespectful to people. I, you know, folks, I, tax collectors and soldiers were a position of authority. Okay? Parenting. Parenting is a position of nurture. If a soldier and a tax collector can't be mean and cheat and disrespect their clients, how should we be treating our very children? I mean, there's something to be said here. And that might mean repentance. We might need to get a handle on it. John was fearless. He was talking about the spirit and power of Elijah. You know, you know who Elijah took on? Jezebel. Oh, that was not smart. Everybody else that took on Jezebel, it was off with their heads. And she tried. John didn't have a Jezebel, but there was a woman. Herod was the governor, shall we say. Herod took the wife of his brother, Philip. As, as chapter 3 begins, all of, the, all of the officials in the government were named. And Herod and Philip were in verse 1. John said, you're not supposed to take your brother's wife. That's not lawful. That's adultery. That's sinning. Now, Herod was a Jew, okay? And John is preaching to the Jewish nation, come back to God. You who know the Lord should act like you know the Lord. But he was fearless. And Herod's wife was so angry that John ended up in prison. And it's before Jesus' ministry really gets going. So he prepares the way, and then he goes to jail. But he was faithful. He said, repent, and that goes for the little people, and that goes for the big people. That goes for the powerless and the powerful. The repentance was across the board. It's time for the Messiah to come. Everyone needs to repent. It didn't matter who his audience was. 
He was the same with them. In his imprisonment, John spending quite some time there would hear stories about Jesus. And he sent word by his disciples and he said, Ask Jesus, are you the one? The one I said you were. Are you that one? And Jesus was, was very gentle and warm with his response. Tell John what you see. The blind see, the deaf hear, the poor have the gospel. Preach to them. The dead are raised. The lepers are cleansed. And it's good if you don't stumble over me. Here's my point this morning. John lived a rough life. I don't know how you feel, or how you would characterize your life. I, 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 I'm going to go out there and say, we've got some rough folks in our audience this morning. That is, you've had a rough time. Life hasn't been smooth, sometimes not fair, certainly not easy. And at times... When you wonder, is life supposed to be this hard? I hope you'll remember John. Because John had it rough. But John pleased the Lord and was faithful. And he did what he came to do. And the tragedy in my mind, because of the way I think, and I'm just going to tell you, this is not how John thought. But my thought is, you didn't even get to see the Messiah in all his glory. Yeah, the baptism happened and the Spirit descended like a dove and you knew that was Jesus then. But all those things that you were hearing were going on, he wasn't getting to witness. He was in, he was in jail. And John was killed by that woman that didn't like him before Jesus died. John did not witness the resurrection. John did not witness the beginning of the church. There were so many wonderful things that happened as the result of John's ministry, he didn't even get to see. But he saw because faith finishes the story. He believed in this one he was preparing the way for. And he trusted that God was going to bring about things even after he was gone. And he didn't have to be there just to be the witness of that. He lived not by sight, but by the Spirit and by the power of God and the power of that Spirit in him. That, that was, that's what moved John from the time he was six months in the womb until... Herod beheaded him. He lived in the spirit and power of Elijah. He lived by that spirit. And he did his work regardless of who liked it, who was watching, or whether he got to see the end result of the seeds that he planted, which, by the way, he really didn't. Now, I'm going to use a strange word here. I'm going to say knowing... Knowing was enough. How did he know? How did he know? He could see by faith. The angel came and talked to his parents. The angel was with him. He lived by that Spirit of God even in the desert. He went up against some of the most powerful people of his day. You don't do those things if you just kind of have a good idea. <laughs> John's heart was certain. The Hebrew writer says faith makes the things that we're certain of real. And the things that we hope for come about. Because we complete the story by faith. We know, not because we've seen it, but because God said it. Because God promised it. Because God has done this and more in the past. 
And when he says he's going to do this in the future, I just look at this and I say, yeah, that's going to happen. That's how it's going to be. It's going to be just like he said, or even better. Knowing for John was enough. He didn't have to witness it. He didn't have to be there for it. He didn't say, God, that's great and everything, but you know, I, I, really, I really don't want to be around when all this happens. <laughs> it's a good thing. That didn't happen. And here's one that I think you and I struggle with. Numbers weren't important. How many people were baptized, John? There's no number. It says crowds. But you know what? The crowds died down when Jesus came and began also preaching. And people came to John and said, well, aren't you upset that there's more people over there with him than there are over here with you? And John said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's just look at this. This is John chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 32. Among you stands one whom you do not know, who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. John testified, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. And then John goes on to say, He must increase, I must decrease. John was such a humble man. It didn't matter that more people were going to Jesus. That was why he came. Prepare the way for the Lord. The Lord comes. There's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase. I must decrease. He was glad of that. I'm not worthy to untie his shoelaces. John was a real guy. And the rough life did not make him rough. People thought of him as rough, but his heart was tender and humble and such a servant heart. That's what he wanted to happen because of his life. As last week, we talked at the end of the lesson about how God is merciful. If I'd read all 80 verses of Luke chapter 1, you would have heard the word mercy many, many times. It was constant in John's prophecy and story. God is merciful. This is a message of John. Not just repent or else. God is merciful. God is gracious. And here's the way that works in repentance. God is so merciful and gracious because he tells us what needs to change and how to change to be pleasing in his sight. You know the most horrible kind of authority in our lives is the person that, that is harsh and mean and makes us wonder if we're going to be acceptable the next time they walk in the room. That's called abuse. And that is not God. God does not want us to wonder if we're going to be acceptable. He wants us to know exactly what he wants and he wants to call us to himself as if to say, come home. Come home. Now some things need to change. But I want you to come home. And so that is the story that we share, like John shared. It's time because the Lord is near. It's time for us to, to make His paths straight. Make His approach into the world without any blockage from us. Because people look at us and say, well, that can't be the Lord. Now we prepare the way the story is told, and God gets to be the merciful, gracious, heavenly Father to those who do not yet know Him. That's our call this morning. That is my request of you, that you come home. And even if you are not and have never been a Christian, you've never called on His name, you've never participated in the death, burial, and resurrection that we call baptism, if you've never done any of those things, you would still be coming home because you were created as God's child and you've been away and He wants you close. And so our call this morning is to come close. And I ask you to do that now while we stand and sing.